That is a beautiful song. Our God is love. He has provided for us all things. This morning, I want to talk about uh, something near and dear to to my heart. It's children. It's raising children. Um, I've been blessed. Uh, my wife and I, with four children, four, uh, three, four, four girls, three girls and one boy. Um, could have been four girls. Um, but yeah, he's, he's blessed us with four children, and uh, I've got five grandchildren and another one on the way uh, currently. So um, you look around the room and you see children. Uh, all of us have been children. I think I can say that pretty confidently. Um, we've, we've been raised by parents, um, some really great and maybe some not so great. And that's unfortunate because God, the creator, speaks to how to raise children and how to train them up and, and what they need. And so I just want to take some time this morning to go through um, a few things. This is not comprehensive by all means, but I wanted to try to do, uh, if, there were, if I was gonna sit down with somebody really quickly and, and tell them what, as a parent, they needed to do to be a good parent, these are some of the things I would tell them. And so I just wanna share those with you and, and look at scripture together and try to understand really what our Creator God wants us, uh, wants a, of us as parents. And and it wasn't long into my parenthood that I realized the enormous responsibility that God had given to me as a as a father and to us as parents for Jolene and I to raise these children and and. Um, it's, it was an amazing gift from God, and I wanted to do my best to try to raise them the way God wanted. Because I knew, eventually, they're not going to be in my house anymore. And as parents, all of us are bringing up our children and raising our children to let them go. And when you've done your job as a parent, it's kind of... You know, you're, you're retiring as a parent at some point. That's not to say that uh, you don't become something else in their lives, right? Um, and, but you don't have that ability to train them up at that point. So let me just hit, hit the, the, the top level here. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, it says, uh, the, the proverb, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That idea of train is, is uh, it's vast. There's a lot contained in this idea of training up a child. In Ephesians 4, uh, we as fathers are given this uh, command, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. And so that, that the primary responsibility is to the fathers. Now, it doesn't mean moms don't do that, but uh, we need to be very careful fathers as to how we raise our children in discipline and instruction. Those are critical. And in 2 Timothy 3.15, we have this example of Timothy, uh, our, our brother in Christ, who uh, was told by Paul, you know, from, a ch from childhood, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through the faith that is in Jesus Christ. And so uh, Timothy's mom and his grandmother are mentioned as those who had big influences on their lives. His father's not mentioned at all. So moms, grandparents, we all have a stake in raising children. Uh, these are the three things I want to cover. Number one, what do I do? What do I need to do as a parent? Train up my child to know and trust God. Number two, to live grace-filled lives. And number three, to suffer and work well. Um, 
sometimes those go hand in hand. But those are the three that I, I want to cut. So I'm going to go get right into it for the sake of time. So number one, to know and trust God. What this, what this entails is, is um, you know, the, we didn't plan this, but the song we just sang talks about us knowing God. And if we know God, what will be the result? We will love one another. If we don't love, we don't know God. If we don't know God, we don't love. And so part of teaching our children to know God is to know all about God. What are his characteristics? Exodus 34 is a listing of characteristics that God came and specifically told Moses when Moses requested, show me your glory, God came and he actually gave him a description of himself. So if we're going to go anywhere and look for God's description of himself, let's go to what God says. Not what someone says about God, but what God says himself. We're not going to go there, but we're going to read a, a, another text that is actually uh, from there. The, other, the next thing to, that we want to make sure we do is to teach our children to know God's heart, to understand his mind, and to understand God's desires. What does God love? What does God hate? Uh, I just covered that one there. Uh, to know God's purpose and to their, the plan for their lives. There is a plan that God has for our children and for their lives. And we've talked about it actually in the Bible class this morning. And we've, we've heard it in a prayer, Matt led a prayer, talking about us glorifying God with our lives and, and, and being that for him. So as you're raising your children, and, and I know th these are, th I'm just throwing these out here. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about them, but I want to get to some very practical things that we can do to do this. Um, make sure that your children get the 30,000-foot view of God and of the Bible. What I mean by that is sometimes, um, sometimes parents focus on certain areas of Scripture and, and they focus maybe predominantly on the commands and the requirements and the obedience, which I could say I probably leaned in that direction, raising my children. And if I were to raise my children today, I'd probably do it a little different than I did uh, 28 years ago. Um, it, it, would be, it, it would be different. Maybe focus would be different in some areas. Okay, so we, we learn. And so as a parent, as a young parent, give your kids the 30,000-foot view. Who is God? What has he done for, in creation? What does he want of us? And how has he provided for us in this world? Know God's plan to save them from sin. That's, 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 that's a key. And that's based on age. You can't take a two-year-old and teach them, you know, the things that you could teach a 12-year-old. And that's going to be different based on, based on age and what they can, uh, what they can take in. Um, if we've got different age groups in different classes Sunday mornings, and there's a really small age group, right? There's a really small group. What's the smallest group? I, somebody tell me. What age group is the smallest that we've got? Four? First, first, first second grade? Okay, okay. So we, we don't teach a first and second grader what we teach a junior high or a high school student, right? And so some of the basics that we start with is God loves you. God made this, you know. God, God has created these types of things. And so, so that teaching changes through their growth into adolescent and ultimately, as a parent, we want to make sure that our children come to the point that they are going to put their trust into Jesus, into Christ, their sacrifice. And 
primarily off of you as a parent. They're still going to trust us, hopefully, if, if we've been trustworthy. But their full trust needs to be in Jesus Christ. Regardless of where they go in this world, you've, they have a trust and a faith in Jesus Christ that will never be taken away from them. And they will walk according to his will. And it's not incumbent upon me at that point to try to make them obey me. If they're obeying Jesus, right? That's, that's, that's what we're looking for, right? You're, my children are going to obey and follow Jesus even if I'm not obeying and following Jesus, right? And I've told, we've told our children that. Look, if, if you see something that we did as parents that is wrong, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that as a parent. And I'll admit I was wrong, right? And that's, that's part of this process of parenting is we don't get it right. We don't. We don't always get it right. We're not. Only God is the perfect parent. We're just trying to uh, bring, bring them up to, to know him, to know Christ. Let, this verse in Psalm 103 uh, is a psalm of David. And so I want to read this to you. And this section actually quotes Exodus 34, where God comes down and reveals himself to Moses. Okay? And so within this is the description of God, of who he is. And we need to make sure that we're balanced in what we talk about God, in how we describe God. So Psalm 103, verses 1 through 18 total. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles? The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses. His acts to the people of Israel. This is, this is that quote in Exodus 34. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. I'll just stop there. So just notice here... This description David is giving, a man after God's own heart, describing God. Forgiving, healing, redeeming, crowning, satisfying, working righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. That means punishment. That, that means dealing out punishment where it's needed, where justice is required. And then he quotes this, this what Moses heard from God. And, and the Lord gives his own description. And his own description of himself is, I'm merciful, I'm gracious, I'm slow to anger, I'm abounding in steadfast love. Now let me stop right there. What child would run away from someone merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Sometimes, as a parent, we can, because of our actions, we give the wrong impression of God to our children. Overbearing, nitpicky, 
Absolute obedience, you never step out of the line, severe punishment, severe consequences. I dare say there's a few of us in the room who've probably had that, right? So when you say God is your father, and when I try to tell my children God is your father, and they're looking at the only model of a father they've ever seen, they're like, I, I don't know if I want God as my father if he's like you. Right? We've, we've given the wrong impression of God the Father if they're seeing God that way. This is the way God is. I, I paused right in the middle of this whole section. Let me move to the next slide. This is the continuation of a description of God. In verse 11, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father, now he... Here's the description of a father, right? As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. For as, a, for, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone and, it, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. So here, this is just an amazing, uh, amazing description of God. Steadfast love. You can count on it. That's what that idea is. You can count on God loving you. You can't count on God not disciplining you and giving consequences because that's part of love. Part of love, Landon even described it this morning in our Bible class, part of love sometimes is you know, tough love. There are consequences for your actions. I, you don't want to do that because it's harmful, it's unsafe, it'll hurt others, you're going to go the wrong path. You're going to suffer some consequences. That's because I love you. And that's the way God is as well. So we have to give children discipline. And, and the, the last verse here, it says, Steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting, to everlasting on those who fear him. So there's, there's a fear, an, an honor, an awe, a respect of giving God, the keeping God in God's place of who he is and revering him and realizing he has power to kill. He has power to give life and he has power to destroy as well and to punish. And so to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. Um, let, let's just talk about some practical application for, for family now. So from a young age, read, read uh, to, to your children. Uh, get them a little, uh, little picture Bible, you know, with pic pictures are important. But just read with your children. Um, make it a daily habit to just... Read and see the character of God and of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit. You know, don't, you know, you know he's part of, of the Godhead. Talk about God's love. Talk about his creation, his commandments, uh, as the Israelites were told to do in Deuteronomy 6 and in Deuteronomy 11. You know, talk about them when you're walking, when you're riding, when you're gardening, uh, when you're working, when you're playing, um, when you rise up, when you lay down, pray together, pray in the morning, pray at night as they go to bed. This is something that we can do is just ask 
the question, what did God or Jesus do here in this story and why? See if they can reason through the process of God's actions and why God would do that. Uh, challenge, challenge, your, challenge your kids. Challenge them with questions, tough questions, and don't ignore the tough questions. Don't, don't ever just say, well, you don't need to, we don't need to talk about that. You may need to say, um, at some point we'll discuss that if they're, at too, if they're too young to you know, handle it. But just say, okay, we will discuss that someday. It, it may not be right now, but we'll get to that, right? And allow them to wrestle with some questions. Even allow them to have some doubt, but always be willing to go to Scripture and not just say, because I said so. Because that's just the way it is. That's not reasonable. <laughs> go to Scripture. See what the Scriptures say with those questions. And be balanced. And don't, um, you know, some people will come, can come away from the Old Testament and say, well, that's the God of the Old Testament. He was wrathful and angry and always punishing people. When you read through the Old Testament you will see more times or equal, if not, times of God's mercy and compassion and making a way for them. And, you know, he only led, led them off for 70 years and then he brought them all back. God is merciful throughout the Old Testament as well. God is gracious. God is compassionate in all those things that he does. And so he's both just and merciful. Teach them to put their trust in Jesus and obey him and be willing to serve him for the rest of your lives. That's your desire. Uh, teach them um, the answer to the question, what does God require of me? Like, what is God's will? What does God want? And so take time to answer those questions as well. Let's go to number two. Once our children and once we as parents have we really understand who God is and what he's done and the salvation brought to us by Jesus Christ, then we understand the grace that God has extended to us. And the cross is the greatest act of grace that God provided for us to see. God took his son and allowed him to be sacrificed on the cross. That's the, the, great, the cross is that. And our children need to understand that. At the, you know, when they can understand that, that concept. So, as parents, if, if I've been transformed, regenerated, renewed, <clears throat> reborn through the blood of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of my sins that I've submitted to in baptism, and I come up out of the water, the Holy Spirit... I've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm living a spirit-filled life. I'm living a life that is gracious. Now I can allow my children to see that in me. That is something that they can see. And so living grace-filled lives produces thanks to God, love for others, and leading to serving others with God's gifts as well. The term grace can be translated gift. It's the idea of teres, be giving a gift. And so grace or gifts that God has given to us will lead us to love others. And we sang that, we sang the song um, in that regard. Take a look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Here it says, this is speaking to Christians. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. So we've received gifts. We use those gifts to serve. And in this way, we're being stewards of God's grace to us. And so we want basically our children to know that same thing as well, that the grace given to them is then used to live lives that give grace, and the grace just keeps on going to others as well. 
in Titus chapter 2, it's stated this way, For the grace of the God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us. So God gives grace, and God's grace trains us. And we're training our children. So as we are training our children about God and about God's grace, part of the training has to, be requi- has to require that he trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So I just want you to see this transition from God's grace has saved us, God's grace is training us to put aside sin, to live a different life, to live godly lives, and wait for the hope. And so our children, we want them to have that same, to see that same thing. And they see it in us. They see us as we do good works. Let's, move, uh, let's look at just some practical things, practical application for the family. More is caught than taught. Be Jesus with skin on. <laughs> That comes from a story of a little kid who was having a dream, and um, he was not having a good dream, and mom or dad came and woke him up, and he was scared and crying, and, and you know, they said, well, you know, just, just, uh, just think of Jesus. Jesus is with you. Jesus is here. He's with you when you're going through this. You'll be okay. Jesus is with you. And the little boy said, well, I want Jesus with skin on. <laughs> I, I want somebody there in person. Parents, you must be Jesus with skin on. So your kids can see Jesus and how Jesus reacts to problems and how Jesus deals with difficulties. So they know you're training them in just how you're living your life, walking with Christ and walking in the Holy Spirit. Um, Show them how to give grace to others. And it's going to be how you give grace to others. It's going to be um, giving to others. Someone in the neighborhood has a need the the. The, uh, somebody is requiring financial help. Someone needs physical help to do something. You're there to serve others, and your children are watching everything you're doing, whether you, uh, whether you like it or not, or whether you think it happens or not. <laughs> they, they see what is going on. Forgiving when it's difficult. Um, your kids... Your kids probably hear you when you don't think they hear you. Uh, they, uh, they hear what you say in the car, you know, leaving church services. They, they hear your, maybe your complaints or, or your, you know, things that you're bringing up. They, they hear you when you're at the restaurant and the server is not uh, very fast and you're complaining about it and and you're, and they see you when you just won't let something go that a family member has done. Cousin so-and-so or aunt whoever. You just talk about them. And they just know, well, mom, well mom and dad talk about forgiving, but I, I don't know that I see that. <laughs> Our kids are watching. We, we have to be careful. We have to, we have to be, be careful. And just, they see us sacrificing for others. They see, oh, you know, I, I, my plan was to go do this on Saturday, but, you know, this need came up for this brother or sister or friend or family member or stranger, and we just decided we're going to change our plans and help these people, like the Good Samaritan. 
Good Samaritan wasn't planning to help somebody, but he did, right? Sacrificing, that's grace lived out in our lives. Show them you honor and obey God because of his grace. Let let me say that again, but a a little bit different. Show them that you honor and obey God because of his grace, not to get his grace. Let's go to number three. Suffer and work well. These kind of go hand in hand, don't they? Suffer and working. Right. Suffering is normal, and our kids need to know it's normal. Uh, it, it, I, I'm afraid to say that in our society, uh, there may be some who have been raised to think that whenever you're suffering, it's just too much. You know, it's, I don't ever want to be uncomfortable. Um, suffering is normal in life. And our children need to, to learn that it's normal and understand it's normal, and they're just going to have to accept it and lean on and trust God. Life is hard and unjust, but God is good, and he, he is just. And so we, we can't, everything's not going to be fair maybe in this life. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So don't take vengeance for you, on yourself. Let me share you this example of a cocoon. With the, with, this is the concept, right? Suffering is normal, and it's even important, and it could even be a matter of saving or killing you. A man found a cocoon of the emperor moth and took it home to watch it emerge. One day, a small opening appeared, and for several hours... The moth struggled but couldn't seem to force its body past a certain point. Deciding something was wrong, the man took scissors and he snipped the remaining bit of cocoon. The moth emerged easily. Its body was large and swollen. The wings were small and shriveled. He expected that in a few hours the wings would spread out in their natural beauty but they didn't. Instead of developing into a creature free to fly, the moth spent its life dragging around its swollen body and shriveled wings. The the constricting cocoon and the struggle necessary to pass through the tiny opening are God's way of forcing the fluid from the body out into the wings The merciful snip was in reality cruel. Sometimes the struggle is exactly what we need. You think of the example of Joseph, right? All the struggles he went through. That was not fair. His brothers sell him into slavery. He ends up in Potiphar's house. He gets falsely accused. He goes back to prison. He's in prison for a long time. Um, None of that was fair, but it was vital because God used it. So children need to understand suffering. It's all all right. You'll You'll get through it. Trust in God. Trust in God. Don't don't bypass it. Don't snip your cocoon. Don't snip your cocoon. Jesus suffered unjustly too, but it was for our good. Uh, This passage in 1 Peter 2, "For For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. This is exactly the model for our children. Suffer. It's okay to suffer. God will judge. Let's look at the the work part of it. Work is a calling. It's it's not just a job. Work is... has a purpose, and each of us has it. In the very beginning, in Genesis 2.15, the Lord took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it, and that was his job. Adam had a purpose. 
God used that for him to do that work. And work is unto the Lord. Teach our children that we're working for somebody who we can't see. We're working for the Lord for an audience of one, and that is God. Look at these two verses, Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work heartily is for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of your reward. You are serving uh, the Lord Christ. Ephesians 6, 5 and 6 says, Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And so we see this purpose of work uh, is, is for him. So let's look at practical ap- application in your family of suffering. Teach them to treasure hunt when they're suffering. Is there anything that's really valuable that you see that came out of all your suffering? Is there a treasure that you would never part with that you got out of the suffering that you went through? That's what we're, that's what we're talking about, right? What, what good has, have I received from this? Te- teach, I mean, little children can kind of get the concept, but you might have to work with them to be able to understand it fully. Teach that disobedience results in suffering. If you disobey mom and dad, you're going to suffer. It's just the way it is. Right? <laughs> if you don't want to suffer, don't disobey mom and dad. And if you don't want to suffer, don't disobey God. It's the same principle. right? Obedience, be, what is doing what is just and right, and being gracious can all be taught by parents in raising our children. Right? Because that's what God is. Uh, and then the practical application for work, um, early training, pick up toys with a good with a good attitude, with a good attitude, right? Pick up my toys. I'm just doing it because I have to. That, we're, that's, that's not what we want to teach our kids, right? I'm, I just, I'm doing it just because I have to. Well, when it comes to God, they're just going to do it because they have to, not because they actually want to love and honor God and obey him. It's going to be just, uh, well, I'll get the prize when I do the work attitude. And that's not what we want to teach our children regarding the way God works. Um, Weekly jobs and chores done with, again, a good attitude, Um, uh, that kind of thing. Teach them to the purpose of money. First, give. Second, save. Third, spend the rest. You, sometimes it's, we flip that whole thing, right? I'm going to spend everything I get on what I want, and oh, I might save some, and oh, if I have anything left, well, I'll help. I'll give it as a contribution for the church or help other people. I mean, we don't just give here. We give everywhere, right? So first, plan to give. Set money aside to give. Set money aside to save. And then spend what you have left. Um, Teach delayed gratification and plan plan ahead, right? So get rid of those credit cards, I tell you. If you can, don't put anything on a credit card. Teach your children that. Try to teach them that, right? Um, uh, Buy what you can afford. Let me, uh, let me share this with you. This is regarding the idea of doing honest, good work. Um, this is a story regarding uh, a man who is learning a trade. And this young man, Harry's, Harry, had a job. And he was a shoemaker. I know this, this is a... Di- Aided story, but Harry had a job as a shoemaker, and he prepared the well, the leather for the soles of the shoes. He would cut a piece of cowhide to size, soak it in water, and then pound it with a flat-headed hammer until it was hard and dry. 
This was a wearisome process, and he wished it could be avoided. Harry didn't want to do it. Harry would often go to another shoe shop nearby and watch them do their work. This man did not pound the leather after it came out of the water. Instead, he immediately nailed the leather to the shoe that he was making. One day, Harry approached the shoemaker and said, I noticed that you put the soles on while they're still wet. Are they just as good as if they were pounded? With a wink and a cynical smile, the man replied, No, but those customers are going to be coming back much quicker the next time. (laughs) And so Harry hurried back to his boss and suggested that perhaps they were wasting their time by drying out the leather so carefully. Upon hearing this, his employer took his Bible, read Colossians 3.23, which we read, and said, Harry, I do not make shoes just for the money. I'm doing it for the glory of God. If at the judgment seat of Christ, I should have to view every shoe I've ever made. I don't want to hear the Lord say, Dan, that was a poor job. You didn't do your best. I want to see his smile and hear, well done. Good and faithful servant. He never forgot that. Do the job right, even if nobody knows or sees it. Something my dad taught me. Have you ever heard the song by Phillips, Craig, and Dean called, I Want to Be Just Like You? Let me read the lyrics for you. This, this is in closing. Looking at what we want to treat, teach and train our, our children and just thinking about, um, I hope I can read it without um, tearing up, but... I just want to speak to fathers. You've got one, you've got one shot. And maybe, maybe, maybe that's too finite. Because even as fathers, when we mess up, don't be afraid to confess to your kids, I messed up. I, I didn't do the right thing. Because I'm relying on God. And I, I admit I'm wrong. Admit you're wrong to your kids when you're wrong. That's important. I'm just going to read the song. And uh, it, it goes like this. He climbs. Thanks, brother. I might have to have somebody come up who's... Uh, who can, who can read it, but let, let, me, let me try it. He climbs in my lap for a good night hug. He calls me dad, and I call him bud. He climbs in my lap. For a good night hug, he calls me dad and I call him bud. With his hated old pillow and a bear named Pooh, he snuggles up close and says, I want to be like you. I tuck him in bed and I turn and I kiss him good night, tripping over the toys as I turn out the light and I whisper a prayer that someday he'll see that he's got a father in God because he's seen Jesus in me. Lord, I want to be just like you. 
because he wants to be just like me. I want to be a holy example for his innocent eyes to see. Help me be a living Bible, Lord, that my little boy can see or can read. I want to be just like you because he wants to be just like me. I've got to admit I've got so far to go. Make so many mistakes and I'm sure that you know. Sometimes it seems no matter how hard I try, with all the pressures in life, I just can't get it all right. But I'm trying to, so hard to learn from the best, being patient and kind, filled with your tenderness, because I know that he'll learn from the things that he sees, and the Jesus he finds will be the Jesus in me. There's only one way that us as parents can do the job well, and it's through his help. It's through the help of the Holy Spirit. It's through the help of God the Father. It's through the help of what we know of God, and we're trying to convey that to our children. Let your children see your love and passion and desire for God, and you're willing to serve. May God bless you with this. I I pray that, uh, and and, um, seek help, ask for help. If you need help, seek and ask for help. Um, we'd, We'd all love to help wherever we can to be like Christ and to grow in Christ and to, and to serve him. So if there's anyone, uh, let, let's, we're going to stand and sing that last song and um, appreciate everyone being here this morning and the visitors that we have as well. Thank you.